Grab your Bibles if you have it with you. Um, brief word, I won't be before you long. And go with me to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Um, just a couple of things I want to lay before you as I begin a new series today to kind of talk about uh, what God can do in our midst through prayer and to allow God to be God. So do me a favor while you're going to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, prayer changes things. Tell the other neighbor, say, other neighbor, prayer changes things. So today I'm just going to lay a foundation, um, just to lay some foundation because we're going to be here for a little while as we talk about shifting things within the culture of the ministry to allow God to just move and we can align better with God. But before I, I, I go into that, I, I, um, I call this guy a son of mine. I uh, wrote this poem back in 1992. And when I first met him, he was in a difficult place in his life, and he shared this poem with me. I want you to listen to the words of this poem, not so much through the lens of having failures or challenges or difficulties in your life, but I want you to listen to it through spiritual lens, because sometimes we find ourselves going through um, spiritual difficulties and challenges, and we don't know how to process them, and we always want to give the devil credit that I'm going to say to you, he does not deserve, okay? And you're going to see that a little bit in the text this morning. So I want us to stop giving him credit. So listen to the words of this poem. It's entitled Blame. It says, it's easy to pass blame on anyone but you. Why do you have such a problem with the realistic view? If you did something wrong, you should face up to the real blame. When you push off on others, it is you that should be ashamed. Are you really that miserable that you can't accept the truth? When you pass on blame, you had better have proof. Instead of trying to make one feel bad because of what you did or did not do, maybe ask for help, and that won't stop people from loving you. After all, we're all humans, and we all make mistakes. It all comes down to the corrective step that we take. If you were perfect, we wouldn't be here. Respect and honesty is something you should better hold dear. So next time you make a mistake, don't blame someone else. Be responsible for your own actions and take the blame yourself. Amen? Listen to that. Amen. Amen. Troy, thank you, man. Thanks for giving me some rights to read that. So come on, show Troy a little bit of love himself for, um, yeah, for that to allow me to, to look at that myself. So today I want us to look at a text in, in front of us because... As we approach this principle or this subject matter that I'm going to be talking about as it relates to prayer, um, I am learning more and more when it comes to us dealing with challenges and difficulties. Let me, say as, as, let me go as broad as life, and then let me go in our businesses, in our homes, even in our ministries. And today I'm going to talk contextually about Restoration Christian Fellowship for a little bit, but we'll spend some time there. A lot of times, or very seldom, do we look introspectively to see what contribution did we have to the situation, the circumstance, or predicament where we find ourselves. It is real easy to say, I'm in this mess because of you. Come on, y'all. It's real easy to look externally, but I am learning more and more as a leader and as a person of God and as a child of God that a lot of times... Where we find ourselves is normally not the result of circumstances or things external to us, but a lot of times it has to do with us ourselves. I'm going to say amen. Amen. A lot of times it really has to do with the choices we make, with the decisions we make, with the things that we do that has us in the predicaments that we find ourselves. So to begin this series on the fact that prayer changes things, I want to begin with a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Matter of fact, this passage of Scripture is so familiar that we can all quote it. We've heard it a, mi a million times in the 14th verse of Second Chronicles, that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land, right? And we are great at quoting that when we find ourselves in crisis. Come on, say Amen. We are great at quoting that when we find ourselves in difficult and adverse situations. We are great in quoting that to say that God's going to do what God's going to do 
But a lot of time, we miss the pretext that leads up to the reason that God used the words that he did to his son Solomon in responding to Solomon's prayer. So today, I just want to lay a little bit of a foundation and a backdrop and just lay several principles that we're going to be talking about over the upcoming weeks. But one, I want to give you one a week, and today we're going to share that. So I want us to look at this text and kind of flesh it out a little bit to kind of see what God is saying and to move us to the place where we can understand what this passage is saying. So I want to begin with a little bit of literary context. So let me back you up to the text so we can kind of see what's going on here the book, in, in the book of 2 Chronicles. So I'll talk you through um, from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 7, and I'll abstract up very fast. I know it's a lot to cover, but I just want to share a principle. What Second Chronicles is all about is that it chronicles or it details um, the detail of the life of Solomon. And who Solomon is, Solomon is David's son, the one that God appointed to build the temple or the house within which God would dwell. Most of you, if you've been um, in ministry any length of time, you know that David had it within his heart to build this temple for the Lord, but God prevented him from building it because of the blood that was on his hands. So his son Solomon comes to reign or comes to the throne after David had served and he's lived his life and he's moved on. And Solomon takes on the responsibility of building this temple as a house for himself as king and as a house for the Lord. Now, if I want to encourage you to read Solomon, I mean 2 Chronicles chapter 1 all the way to our text today to get a feel. But you will see, when you read the details that's involved here, you will see the amount of, of, of energy, the amount of financial resources, the amount of human resources that Solomon invested into building this house of the Lord. Now, you might be saying, Solomon, why did it take all that? Because Solomon understood the greatness of God. Come on. He, he understood, understood the sovereignty and the magnificence of God. And here was his framework. Here was his framework. It's like, God, if my house look this good, imagine what your house ought to look like. Y'all didn't get that. God, if my house looks this good, imagine what your house ought to look like, right? And, and so he set out with a personal goal in life to set God up such that when anybody came to the place of worship that Solomon had built for God, they would recognize the God that he served to be a sovereign and a supreme and an awesome God. So Solomon finishes the temple. He builds a temple and he moves all the um, elements into the temple. He moves the Ark of the Covenant. He moves everything that the Israelites had while they were in transition in the journey into the temple. Now, where I want to pick up is once the work was finished, Solomon now begins to offer a prayer of dedication to the temple, and he begins this process now of praying to God and talking to God about what God could expect when people come to this place of worship. So look with me. I'm going to read a little bit because I want you all to get the literary context because these words are important and you're going to hear them again. So look to chapter 6. Jump to chapter 6 and jump down to 24. Verse 24 of chapter 6, I'm in the ESV, and I want to encourage you to read along with me. If you're in verse 24, say amen. So notice what he says. Here's Paul, I mean Solomon in his prayer in the book of Chronicles. And here's what Solomon says. If your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you. Don't miss that. And they turn again, meaning that they repent and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house. Speaking about the temple he just built. Then hear from heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave them and to their fathers. Then look at 25. He says here, And when heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned. You guys notice that? Interesting. Against you. And if they pray toward the place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin, um, when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people, Israel, when you teach them the good ways in which they should walk and grant 
um, rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. Look at the next verse. If there is famine in the land, if there is pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemies besiege them in the land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by man or by all your people Israel, each knowing his own affliction and his own sorrow and stretching out his hand towards his house, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you only know the hearts of the children of mankind that they may fear you and walk in your ways all the days that they live in the land that you gave them. Jump down to verse 36. Look at verse 36. Say amen if you're there. Watch this. If they sin against you, and here's what Solomon said to God, for there is no one who does not sin, Lord Jesus, and you are angry with them and you give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near, yet if they turn their hearts to the land to which they have been carried captive, he says, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned. We have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their captivity to which they are carried captive and pray toward their land, it says, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have left, built for your name, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. See how many times he says God is in heaven. Their prayers and their pleas and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Now, O oh God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. Okay? Now, I wanted to read that because I wanted you to hear Solomon as he is dedicating this temple that he built to the Lord. His, 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 his plea toward God about how God ought to respond to what happens to the people in his house. I want you to hear me say that carefully. And then now, I want you to see, secondly, how God responded to Solomon's prayer. Okay? So look at chapter 7. Look at chapter 7. As soon as Solomon had finished his prayer, it says, Fire came down from heaven and consume the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the house. Y'all too quiet, I'm telling y'all. And it says, when all the people of Israel saw that the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good and for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen? Now, now let me paint a picture. Solomon, well, let me back up. Things were going good. Come on, say things were going good. Everything was on the up and up. The people were worshiping God. They were in a good relationship with God. And in the good times, they decided to build this temple as a place where God can come inhabit and where the Spirit of God was dwell, would dwell. And so God affirmed the prayer of Solomon by manifesting himself in the presence of the people and in the house that Solomon had built for him. So it seemed at the onset that there was a good relationship going on with God. And so the dedication of the temple continues in verse 4 all the way down to verse 10. You can read that on your own time. And then verse 11 talks about, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord, and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Okay. Look at verse 12. Now, once everything was done, and Solomon had laid his prayer out to the Lord, and God responded in the presence of people, here's where I want to pick up. Then God shows up, and it's almost as if God now is having a conversation with Solomon as the leader of the Israelites to affirm what Solomon prayed to him and to communicate back to Solomon God's expectation of his people. Come on, I want y'all to get this. Say, the text is about the children of Israel. 
This is very, very important. The text is not so much about the world. This is an important thing, all right? Because sometimes we quote this text out of context and we say if we want to heal Aurora, we ought to pray and God will do this in Aurora. I want to be pointed here. The text is not about Aurora. Come on, y'all. The text is not about the United States. The text is not about the world. The text is about the church of God, the people of God, and God's expectation from his people. Are you with me? Come on. I want you to hear me because the text doesn't say, the text doesn't say, hey, God, when the sinners mess up and the sinners come to you in prayer because I want the record to reflect sinners don't know how to access God like that. I want you all to hear me this morning. But it's talking pointed about me and it's talking about you. Come on. I wish I had somebody in here. The text is speaking to us on what we need to do to be the people of God and to get to where God would have us. So look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this place as a house of sacrifice. Lord have mercy. Let me, let me, this, this is a parenthetic because I want you to know that every place of worship, every house where people come together to name the name of the Lord, God has chosen as his place of worship. Are you hearing me? And, and don't make the mistake, don't make the mistake once again of doing a literal transfer of the text into the New Testament era and restrict what I'm trying to say to you to the inside perimeters of the wall because you'll lock into this with me. In the New Testament, God doesn't need a building because your body now, come on, is what? Y'all getting it? Yeah, yeah, you guys are so smart. Your body is the temple. So here's what the direct correlation. God is saying to you, I have chosen you as a place for me to worship. I've chosen you as a dwelling place. Come on, do I have any witnesses here? I've chosen you as a place within which to dwell, within which I can encounter you. He shows up at night, then he says this. And so then, notice what he says. Come on, say, the text is about me. I need everybody to get that. One more time. The text is about me. Need I go back to the poem? Be responsible for your own actions and take the blame yourself. That's why I said don't hear this through the lens of the fact that you might have had an overdose or you might have a failure in your marriage. Hear it through spiritual lens. Are you with me? One more time. Say, the text is about me. So look at verse 13. Look at verse 13. It says here, I mean, 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. One more time. Verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. This is the pretext, okay? This is very, very important because there's a couple of things I want you not to miss in the text. I want you to see, first of all, that God is the subject of all the verbal actions in verse 13. Don't miss that. The text does not say in verse 13, when the devil does this to you. Y'all ain't ready for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember I said to you, everything was going good when the temple was built. And Solomon laid out some details of a prayer. And God let some time elapse. And then God shows up to Solomon again and he says to him, hey, bro, I got you. I heard what you said. Now let me restate what I heard you say and let me tell you how I function. Now watch this. So he says, when I shut up the heavens, let me read this again, so that there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or I send pestilence among my people. And, and here's the thing I want you all to reckon with, because what the text seems to be implying and seems to be saying, that back in that day, no rain signifies no relief in life or a dry place. Let me go here. Anybody in here ever been in a dry place? 
I need a couple of witnesses. You with me? Anybody in here ever been in a place where you can't figure out tomorrow, where you can't see what's going to happen? Come on. Where you, I wish I had two people that would say, I've been there, preacher, where I don't know, where you don't know where stuff is going to come from. How are you going to make it into tomorrow? Let the record reflect. If your body is the temple of the Lord, can't nobody do that to you, but I wish I had somebody in it. This is where I want to go because God is saying to Solomon, hey, Solomon, let the record reflect. When I stop the rain, because nobody can command the rain but God himself. So here's the deal. When you find yourself in a place where it feels dry, where it feels desolate, where it feels like a desert place, and you don't know what's next, don't make the mistake into thinking that somebody other than me is working on you. Secondly, when I send the locust, what does locust look like in the Old Testament? It would come and it would eat up the fields and there would be no provision. <laughs> you all ever been broke? I'm trying to help because, and, 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 and let me just let the record reflect. I think this message is more for me than it is for anybody else in here, right? You ever been in a place where you can't seem to get past the $5 it requires to keep your bank account open? <laughs> y'all been there? Come on, y'all been there, right? And you put 10 in it, you got 15, but before you can even leave the bank, you got to go to the ATM outside the bank to make a which. I think God is sending some locusts, right? This is a good one. When I send pestilence, right? What does pestilence signify? To me, it talks about some sickness and some health challenges, right? Anybody ever been through some things in your, come on, y'all. Talk to me. Let's be honest this morning, right? I am not talking about the world. I'm not talking about people outside of the confines of the body of Christ. I'm talking about the very members of the household of God because God now is having a dialogue with Solomon about the very people that just built this house for him. Context is very, very important. Are you hearing me? And God is saying now to Solomon, when I do these things, when the rain stops, when the locust shows up, when the pestilence um, shows up in a place, and here's what he says, being the subject of the verbal phrases, when I do it. Okay? Now, here's where I want to take just, just a couple of minutes, and then next week we're going to flesh this out some more. The question I want to raise is why would God shut up the heavens so there is no rain? Why would God command the locusts to devour the land? Why would God send pestilence among his people? Why would God do that to me? Why would God do that to you? Why would God do it to the Israelites, the very people that he called and chose by his name, right? That's the question. The question comes down, why would God do that? And I want to lay this premise before you as we move into the text. Could it be that we are where we are because we have disobeyed him. Come on. Could it just happen to be that we have disobeyed him? You see, in today's culture, we don't understand disobedience, right? Because when I came up, disobedience did not result in time out. Not when I was coming up, amen? When I was coming up and I disobeyed, the rain was withheld, amen? The locusts came. Come on, y'all. I felt like I was going through severe pestilences. Come on, amen, because it wasn't just a bell. I had to go get a switch from the street. Eh? Come on. Y'all don't know nothing about that, amen? And, and, and the only reason that happened, it wasn't because I was being a good student and I was being a good child and I was loving and, and obeying my parents. Something that I did that resulted in this, I wish I had somebody in here, that disobedient that caused me to incur the wrath of my parents. Now lock into this. The wrath didn't come because my parents didn't love me. The hardest thing I had to process, I'm doing this because I love you. I, and I'm like, if you love me, then stop, you know. 
you know. <laughs> but, but anybody ever heard those phrases, is it just me? Maybe y'all didn't beat like that in America, but boy, I tell you where I come from, hey, it wasn't no social service to come get you from the house. Amen. Today, 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 I've got grandkids now, amen. And grandkids act up. They look at me like, what you going to do? I just simply say, I'm from the old school, you know what I mean? So you get it, right? So, so it's normally the result of something we did. So here's what, here's, what, here's, what, here's what 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 36 says. Jump over there real quick, jump over real quick. Here's what he says. He says, if they sin, this is Solomon's word, if they sin, if they're sin. And notice what he says, for there's no one who does not sin. For there's no one who does not sin. And you are angry with them. Right? So the text seems to kind of imply, 1 John 1 and 9, um, verse 10 says, if we say we have no what? Sin. We do what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let me go back to the poem. Before I cast blame, I need to start conducting some introspection to see what was my part, come on, in the no rain or the no locust or the pestilence that has shown up. I might have done something. Look at the next one. Job, Deuteronomy 28. I'm not going to go there because we'll go there Wednesday. We, we, we're good at the front part of Deuteronomy 28, right? And we miss the context. If my people obey my commands and they do these things, here's what he said. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not below. You're the borrower. You're not the lender. Y'all know it, right? But I bet you nobody in here can quote what verse 19 onward says. You get it. But if you disobey me. Nobody, and here's, here's the sad commentary. We are in disobedience, but we walk around talking about I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the borer and not the lender. I'm the first and not the last. But you're in disobedience. And the funny thing about that text is only people who don't see rain, who are encountering locusts, who are dealing with pestilence, quote those scriptures. <laughs> Think about it. Folk whose finances are in order, yeah, y'all know it. Folks whose life are in order, don't go around saying that. But it's more times than often, those of us that are in disobedience, we encourage ourselves, listen to me, with the promises of God. And I'm standing before you this morning to let you know it won't work. Let's be honest this morning. Okay, let's deal with the text. Can we do that this morning? I want to help us all get there, right? You remember Job. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out, here's Job, and we don't have time to go there because I'm out of time. So let me just say something. I'm going to go through the text and we'll pick it up next week. Satan came to God's business meeting and said to him, God said, where you been? And he says, I've been roaming through and fro from the, her the earth and um, looking for someone to devour, right? Satan said this. Y'all remember that, right? And then God said to him, hey, you, have you bumped into Job yet? And he's like, yeah, I bumped into him, but I can't get to him. And I got, what do you mean you can't get to him? Well, there's this thing called a hedge that you have around him, right? And because of the hedge that, that you have there, I can't get to him. And, and God probably said to Satan, y'all, this part ain't in the Bible. I'm just kind of helping you with this. He's like, what do you mean the hedge is always up? Well, I can't get him to disobey you. Ah, yeah, you get it now, you get it now. And the principle that I'm trying to communicate is as long as we walk in obedience, the hedge is up. Ah, yeah, you get it, you get it? As long as we walk in obedience, the hedge is up and nothing externally can access us. Because I'm trying to get us to stop this lie or propagate this thing. Now, I'm not talking spiritual warfare, but I'm talking every time I go through something, pray for me, the devil is on my back. No, 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 no. The devil can't come on my back if the hedge is up. How did he get in? How did he get in? If I'm a child of God and the promises is true that I'm the temple of the Lord and I'm walking and I'm walking in obedience and doing everything God calls me to do, how did he get in? How did he get in? So it seems to imply that the only crack that happens in the hedge has to be a result or product of my disobedience. Y'all get this? My disobedience. And as long as you remain defiant in disobedience, I allow access for the enemy to come in. 
So then look at the next thing as we kind of move through this, right? So, so let's read, let's look at verse 14. Then I'll pick this up next week because I just want to lay foundation. Verse 14 says then, let me read 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, and I command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Look at verse 14. If my people. If who? I need everybody to say it again. If who? One more time. This is not talking about the world. It's talking about me, and it's talking about you. If my people, who were called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and I want to just hit on this word, and turn from their wicked ways, see that? Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and heal the land, their land. Look at verse 15. And now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers that is made in, let me fix that pronoun, the temple. Okay? So here's what happens. Something has been broken and I am in my temple and I'm praying and I can't get through. And God can't hear me. And I have to analyze now, why are my prayers not working? Why is it that we can't get all the financial resources that we need to do what God wants done? Why is it that I can't get my life in order? Why is it that I can't turn things around in my life? I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm seeking God. And I'm trying to say to you, as black and white as I can, that does not work as long as we are in disobedience. Now hear me out. You figure out what disobedience is, just like I've got to figure out what disobedience is for me. Is that fair? Amen? We, we all have to do it for ourselves. So here's the thing. If we're going to turn things around, here's what the scripture says. We must have humility to own our sins. Don't cast blame. If we say, well, I ain't done nothing wrong, you deceive yourselves. <laughs> Excuse this, don't hear this wrong, but the truth is not in you. That's euphemistic for saying, you're lying. Because we all got something going on. Can we be honest with that this morning? We all have, me too. Amen? Me too. We had our new members class yesterday, and every new members class, Katani and I are pretty transparent about some of the things we've gone through in life. And people look and say, oh, you so, y'all just tell everything. I say, yeah, because we don't want to have to lie and miss the blessings of God. And then even after that, we still go home and we got to repent. Lord, if we miss something, forgive us because we know we did. They weren't ready to hear that part, God, so just forgive us. <laughs> Are we going to say? Yeah, amen. Let me tell on my wife, amen. Baby, forgive me, okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. She, w- she was sharing yesterday at... Are you re- oh, y'all already know about that? I must have been in Africa. Okay, y'all hear it already. She said she told you. I heard about the slip of the mouth and all. Oh, okay. I'm a, oh, forget that, okay. Yeah, she just told me yesterday, amen. So, so that means she's been walking in disobedience the whole, no, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, yeah. yeah. And, and so we have to pursue God's ways. Listen to this. This is the part that's, 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 that's hitting me the most. Secondly, we need to pursue God's ways, God's ways by developing a culture of prayer. That's painful for me because it's saying to me as a leader, Pastor Felix, this house has not quite yet become a house of prayer. We pray, but we're not a house of prayer. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Come on, y'all. Amen. We pray, but we're not a house of prayer. Let me black and white. And you wonder why we have financial challenges. You wonder why we find ourselves not realizing the vision the way we should. You wonder why we are where we are struggling to get people involved in ministry. Hear me out. We pray, but we're not a house of prayer. Right? Some of you pray, but are you a praying temple? And this is the part that hurts the most. Then it says, change course and pursues God way, God's ways. That's hard because here, here's the thing that I want you all to lock into. Here's the big idea. Is that repentance then is God's condition for answered prayer. So here's what that means. We can have all the prayer meetings we want. But if we don't begin with repentance, we're praying while in disobedience. And what happens? The hedges crack 
The enemy can come in all day long, and God's going like this. That's the text, right? Read it when you go home. So let me stop with this. I want you all to get this last thing. We'll pick it up next week. So I did a little bit of word on that Hebrew word shub. And here's what to turn means. To make linear motion back to a point previously departed. That's, that's meaningful to me. Let me help you all with this. There was a time in my life where God was here. And in my excitement, I'm pursuing God. And I'm walking toward God. But then life happens, and I change course, right? And I stop pursuing God, whatever direction the course was changed with. And what Second Chronicles 7.14 says is that I've got to humble myself to point the finger here and nowhere else. Nowhere else to point it here, right? Then I've got to seek God's face and then turn from my wicked ways. And I love that definition because turn says I don't have to go this direction. I need to go, listen to this, in a linear fashion to the place where I departed from. Here's what that means in English. Go straight back to God with no pit stops. <laughs> a linear, I love Hebrew, a linear fashion right back to the point. I want to challenge Restoration Christian Fellowship, everybody who attends here. If we can get our act together and start obeying God and becoming a house of prayer, 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, there is nothing God won't do for us. I'm going to say that confidently with confidence that there's nothing God won't do for us. Let me give you a quick illustration. Imagine if all of us here would obey God in our finances, where each of you would be financially. You know why it's so quiet right now? Because I just identified a disobedience for the majority of us. Can we be honest? You kind of get what I'm saying? And that's just one. There's other areas in our life. See, most of you were thinking this. I ain't sleeping with nobody, so I ain't disobedient. I ain't stealing nobody's money, so I ain't disobedient. And as long as your definition of disobedience is that broad, it's easy to cast blame. But when you see disobedience in the subtleties of where God says to you, can't you spend an hour with me in prayer? Can't you spend time devoting yourself, reading my word daily? When we define disobedience through the lens of God, it changes the framework. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Can I get what I'm saying? Because it's easy for me to come home to my wife and say, I've been good today. I ain't looked at no women. I ain't done nothing. I've been honest today, right? I can say that. And in my own self, I can become, listen to the word, self-righteous. <laughs> How is God seeing me? And is God going like this to my prayers? Because I've been completely sold out to him. <sighs> the prayer this morning is this. That as a people we can begin the process of repentance. That will be the condition for answering prayer. So you're going to hear me talk a lot about prayer in the upcoming weeks. Because I really believe God wants to do something there. God wants to do something there. So here's how I want to end service today. What should you do? Y'all can hang tight. Y'all can hang tight right there. Here's how I want to end service today. I want us all to begin an introspective look of ourselves, right? Lord, let me see the person in the mirror. Let me not look outside of me. Let me not look at the next person. It's easy to pass blame on anyone but you. Why do you have such a problem with the realistic view? If you did something wrong, you should face up to the real blame. When you push off on others, it is you that should be ashamed. Are you really that miserable that you can't accept the truth? 
when you passed on blame, you had better have proof. Instead of trying to make one feel bad because of what you did or did not do, maybe ask for help. That won't stop people from loving you. After all, we are human and we all make mistakes. If it all comes down to the corrective step you take, if we were perfect, we, couldn't be, we wouldn't be here or couldn't be here. Respect and honesty is something you should hold dear. So the next time you make a mistake, don't blame someone else. Be responsible for your own actions. Take the blame yourself. We end with this. God took the blame on himself for my sin. Incarnated himself. Went to Calvary and died on that cross for something he didn't do. Because he took the blame to bring me to a relationship back with him. If he can do that for us, why can't we do it for him? Bow your heads with me. Search me, O oh Lord. If there be anything in me that's not like you, remove it. Create within me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Holy Spirit, forgive me from me. Because it's so easy with eyes to see outside and not inside. And it's easy to miss you. As you begin this teaching on prayer and this conversation on prayer, the key to answered prayer is repentance. So I want to be holy, a vessel tried and true. I want to be holy, God, consecrated to you. So when you went to Solomon in the middle of the night, after you had processed Solomon's prayer and you came back to him, and you said to him, Solomon, when the rain stops and the locusts come and pestilence hits, remind the people, Solomon, that they're called by my name. And the only reason I am withholding is not because, God, I don't love them. It's because they miss me. And my hand being withheld from them ought to be a reminder for them to return to me. Here's what you said in Malachi. Return to me and I will return to you. We need you, God. I need you, God. We need you in our lives. Every hour, God, every day. Every hour. We need you, God. Oh, bless us, God. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, Lord. I come to 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 thee y'all know this come on say i need the oh i need thee every hour i need thee oh bless me now my sin Cleanse us, Lord. God, cleanse us, Lord. We're desperate for you, God. We're tired of the challenges of life. And now we're seeing why. Forgive us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. 
Forgive me, God. Forgive me. The Solomon of this house, forgive me, God, for missing you. Turn this place around, God. We turn to you. That you sit on the throne in this house. In your name we pray. Take a moment in your own way. Take a moment in your own way and go to God. In your own way. In your own way. Take a moment in your own way. Your own way. Here's how we're going to end service. I know Pastor Tony was scheduled to come. Just grace me for, come, all right, come on anyway, come on. I want to do this different. Ushers, I'm going to invite you to the front. Ushers, I want to invite you to the front with your baskets. Please grace me, ushers. And I'm going to invite us just to, we're in this place that symbolizes the temple of the Lord. Get your best offering and say, God, I'm turning things around. I'm going to do it differently, Lord, and I'm going to put you first. And let's just come and we lay our best gifts and I'm going to go here, and even if you don't have nothing to give, you come touch the basket and say, God, I'm going to grow to have. I'm going to be there in your own way. The best you have. Let's turn this thing around. Let's begin turning it around and allow God to be God in our midst. Father, as people give this morning, as they prepare to bring, we pray, God, that you move in this place. You touch their hearts. We know the hour is late. We know it's long. We get that, Lord. But your presence is in this place, and we don't take that lightly. So, Father, those that are bringing their best gift, their tithe, those that are returning to you to say, I'm going to stop my disobedience, and I will be obedient. God, bless. We pray for miracles. We pray for healings. Now we're understanding why they don't happen. We get it. We're going to return to you. Bless every household, every person that's here. <sighs> that they receive and see your hand. 